G'day, this is Chris Savage from Our Real Ministries in Australia, welcoming you to this session of the Faith Foundations. I pray that this will be a benefit to you and help you in your Christian growth. Thank you for coming along. So welcome along to the first session for 2024. We're looking at the biblical principles of giving. We're going to look at this in, uh, this is part one. In this session, we've got a couple more parts to do. So what do we know about biblical principle of giving? Well, in uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 3 to 4, Paul writes, For according to their power, I bear witness, yes, and beyond their power, they gave of their own accord, beseeching us with much entreaty in regard of this grace and the fellowship and the ministry to the saints. Here he's speaking about the saints giving for him on, be on behalf of him. Now, in this subject, we're going to look at three major categories. First of all, we're going to be looking at the principles of giving, which is what we're going to do tonight. And secondly, the amount of giving. And thirdly, the recipients of giving. Now, in, in all of this, uh, by way of introduction, three things are going to be mentioned first. First of all, it's going to be in, in the biblical principles here that it's the relationship between stewardship and giving. Secondly, the underlying truth of giving. And thirdly, the hindrances to giving. Believe it or not, there are hindrances to giving. Hard to believe, isn't it? Now, relationship between stewardship and giving. Giving, uh, giving is only a part of the greater comprehensive subject of stewardship. Stewardship covers everything about us. Stewardship is a much wider concept and deals with everything that God has given us. All the things he's given us, it is, we are stewards of it. It includes material things. It includes spiritual things, such as things as spiritual gifts, for instance, knowledge, abilities. In this subject of stewardship, one is concerned with how one uses all of these things on behalf of the Lord and for the Lord's work. So that's stewardship. Now, giving is just one facet of stewardship, and it deals specifically with the aspect of monetary things or financial things. It, how we do what, what do we do with the money that he's entrusted to us? The issue is what God gives the believer and what portion of it is given back to him by means of supporting the Lord's work. So the relationship of giving to stewardship is that giving is a part or portion of the much greater comprehensive subject of stewardship. Now, in this study, stewardship will not be dealt with in its totality, but only one facet of stewardship, and that is the biblical principles of giving. Now, the underlying truth of giving. Now, we need to emphasize this underlying truth which is based on James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. From this verse, we can glean three things. We can learn three things from this verse. First of all, God owns all things. He owns everything. Secondly, God is the creator. He's the maker, and he is the giver of all things. Everything that we have has come from the good hand of God. Thirdly, when the believer gives, right, all he's doing is, or she's doing, is returning a portion of that which belongs to God anyway. We're simply returning a portion back to him. This is the underlying truth, which should never be forgotten. God owns it all. He's given it, everything that we have, no matter how hard we've worked and we've gained wealth, whatever, it's been given to us by God. And when the believer gives, what he's doing is he's returning a portion of that which belongs to God anyway. Hindrances to giving? Well, there, there are several hindrances we're going to look at here. Um, five hindrances are going to be mentioned or, or discussed here. First of all, the concept of the tithe. Okay, This is the first hindrance that keeps people from giving biblically. And it's the tithe concept, the concept of the tithe. Some people are so tied into the tithe concept that they feel all they ever have to give is a mere 10%. When they give away 10% of their income, they feel that they have fulfilled all their financial responsibilities to the Lord. So what we see here is that the, the concept of the tithe can actually be a hindrance to biblical giving. 
There's also this misunderstanding about grace giving or, or a lack of understanding of grace giving. Because many believers do not understand uh, the concept of grace giving, this, this also becomes a hindrance to giving. The American or the Australian lifestyle, you know, uh, this is a third hindrance, our lifestyle, our Western lifestyle. Sometimes a believer gets so caught up with trying to keep up with one's friends and neighbors that he begins to spend more and more time and money and material things than actually on the Lord's work. It's amazing how often <laughs> in the Australian lifestyle, that which is which is merely a, a, a want, you know, I want this. All of a sudden, it becomes a need. I need this. Well, we don't need it. One needs a new car. Why? The old one's pretty good, you know. Or one needs a new TV. Why? Because it's the latest model. The older one still works well. So why do we need a new TV? Well, because it's the newest model. Or one has to have the latest smartphone with, with, the, with, the, with the cameras with five lenses or whatever it is. One doesn't really need to have any of these things. One can get by quite sufficiently with all the, all the ordinary things that we have. While one has every right to save money for once, he must be careful not to confuse wants and needs. Often our lifestyle is based more on that which is wanted rather than that which is needed. And in this way, uh, our Australian lifestyle, uh, our Western lifestyle could be, if not kept in its proper perspective, be a hindrance to giving. Why? Because we've spent all our money on things which we want. Tax deductible receipts is another thing. This is a fourth possible hindrance to giving is tax deductible receipts. Now, we're all in favor of receiving a tax deductible receipt, you know, so we can claim it, uh, claim your giving off your taxes. However, the hindrance here is that some people will not give to anything unless they can get a tax deduction on their gift. Now, when one can get a tax deduction, so fantastic. He should give because by means of getting a tax deduction, one can then give even more money to the work of the Lord rather than to the work of Caesar. However, there might be situations when one is called upon to give and it may not be possible to get a tax deductible receipt. And, and what we've seen, what we see happening is, is that people don't give. Now, you know, suppose one is impressed with an independent missionary, a, a, a guy doing a marvelous job as a missionary, who for one reason or another was not able to become part of a, a big missionary society or missionary board. Yet that missionary is doing a great job, a great work, and he has a very effective ministry. Should one then refrain from giving to that missionary just because he's not able to get a tax deduction from his income tax? While tax deductible receipts are a good thing, if one gives only on the basis of getting them, then this can also be a hindrance to giving. Yeah. What about covetousness? This is another hindrance to, to giving. Just pure and simple covetousness. And this ties in closely with the, with the Australian lifestyle here, but it, it may be apart from it. One who, one who covets many things tends to divert his energies towards purchasing such things. So covetousness can also be a hindrance to giving. The one who is covetous follows the principle of Luke 12, 15, in that he feels that his life consists in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Uh, Colossians 3, 5 gives us a, a warning. Colossians, Colossians 3, 5 points out that covetousness is actually idolatry and it should be avoided in every way. It should be avoided in every way. So that there are five things which are, which are a hindrance to giving. Now, the principles of giving. First main category of, the, of this study is the principles of giving. We're going to look at this in three parts. First of all, the basic principles. Uh, and then secondly, the principles found in 2 Corinthians 8, verses 1 to 5. And then third, the principles found in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 14. Okay. Five basic principles of biblical giving. First of all, giving is a measure of the believer's love for God, right? 
Secondly, giving is an expression of faith. Third, the believer will never outgive God. Fourth, giving should be done in secret. And the fifth principle is that the believer should be willing to work in order to give more. These are just five basic principles which we're going to look at. Okay, giving is a measure of one's love for God. This is the first basic principle. So our giving, or our believer's giving, is actually a measure of his love for God. Uh, the way the believer gives and the percentage he gives will often be a measure of his love for God. Matthew uh, 6, 19 to 21. It, it's Matthew 6, 19 to 21. says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust nor rust doth consume and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where thy treasure is, there will thy heart be also. Now, this passage in Matthew, Matthew 6, 19 to 21, teaches that laying up treasures in heaven is what the believer should be doing. For that is where the treasure is, that where is where the heart is also. So if the believer is laying up treasures here on earth by collecting all these wants and, and, and filling their house and, and keeping up appearances with the neighbors and stuff, then the believer's heart will be on earthly things, not on heavenly things. But if the believer is laying up his treasures in heaven, his heart will be on heavenly things. Also, um, 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 18. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Now, this, this little, these couple of verses here teaches that the rich should have their hope set on God, and they should be ready to give out of their wealth. Those who are wealthy believers should still remember that their hope is not on their wealth. Rather, their hope is set upon the Lord God. They should be ready to give out of their wealth to support the Lord's work. Also, we find in 1 John 3, 17, where it states that if one uh, does not give, then the question is, does the love of God abide in him? If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So what, uh, what John is writing here, he says that, if a person does not give, it could be truly questioned whether the love of God was ever in him. Giving as, as an expression of, of one's faith. This is a second basic principle. And this one is found in James chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, where giving is an expression of faith. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So here, James teaches that the believer shows his faith by his works. And one of the ways that the believer can show his faith is by the work of giving. The believer is not saved by works. Okay? So it's only by faith that the believer is saved. But the saved state of that individual should be evidenced by his good works. And one of these works is the work of giving. Third basic principle is that the believer will never outgive God. More giving will result in more receiving. Now, this is a promise from God that the believer can count on. Luke chapter 6, verse 38 states, Give and it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall they give into your bosom. Philippians 4, uh, verses 15 to 19, also teaches that, that, that if the believer gives, God will supply his needs. God, my God, shall supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So what Paul is saying here is that the believer need not worry about his needs as God will take care of those things. 
He should be more concerned about giving because giving will result in God supplying the believer's needs. The fourth basic principle in giving is that giving should be done in secret. It shouldn't be done for show according to Matthew 6, 1 to 4. In Matthew 6, 1 to 4, look, we're looking at from verse 2. It says, When therefore thou doest alms, sound not a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be given in may be in secret, and thy father who seeth in secret shall recompense thee. So what we're what, what Jesus is saying to us here is that. The believer should not show off his giving, okay? The believer should keep his giving a secret. That's why, uh, you know, I remember in, in times past, we used to have church envelopes where you, you'd put your offering in there, nobody knew what you did, and you just drop it into the plate. The concept of church envelopes is actually a biblical concept. Why? Because nobody else knows what you're giving. Now, another, the fifth basic principle is that the believer should also be willing to work to be able to give more. Acts 20, 33 to 35. You yourselves know that these hands, this is Paul, ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. In all things I gave you an example that so laboring you ought to help the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul teaches us here that he worked so that he could give. He worked so that he would have finances to give to those who had need. Ephesians 4, 20, 28 tells, tells something similar. It says, let him that steal, steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing that is good that he may have whereof to give to him that has need. So work with your hands so that you can have finances to give to those who have, have need. And this is what Ephesians 4, 28 teaches us. This teaches us that others should follow Paul's example working away so that you got finance to help those in need and therefore glorify God. Now we're looking at the principles found in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 15. This is the second part of the principles of giving is to look at a number of principles which, you, which we're going to see here in this passage. As Paul deals with these principles in 2 Corinthians 8, uh, he makes eight points here. First of all, first point is, that the Corinthians were admonished to follow the example of the Macedonians, all right, in that they did not make their poverty an excuse for not giving. We see this in verses 1 to 2 of 2 Corinthians 8. Paul says, writing to the Corinthians, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, how that in much proof of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded onto the riches of their liberality. What's he saying here? Well, the Macedonians were not wealthy people. Verse 1 stated that they practiced grace giving, which we're going to discuss uh, in another uh, session. For now, it should be noted that the method that the Macedonians used was not the principle of the tithe, but the principle of grace giving. Also in verse 2, it reveals that they gave out of their deep poverty. They were willing to give liberally. So they did not make their poverty an excuse for not giving, but rather they practiced grace giving. They, out of their deep poverty, they gave liberally. Second point of the principles of giving is that they looked upon giving as an opportunity to be sought in, in verses 3 to 4. For according to their power, I bet this is Paul again, he's writing to the Corinthians, he's talking about the Macedonians. For according to their power, I bear witness. Yes, and beyond their power, they gave of their own accord, beseeching us with much entreaty in regard of this grace and the fellowship in the ministering to the saints. For these believers, for these Macedonian believers, uh, giving was an opportunity. They actually looked upon giving as an opportunity to be chased after, to be sought after. They actively investigated ways that they could give. And these guys are in poverty. Verse 3 states that they gave beyond their own power and their own free will. 
According to verse 4, they investigated the needs and did what they could to meet those needs. Now, the third point Paul makes here is found in verse 5. And this, not as we had hoped, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord and to us to the will of God. So the reason that the Macedonians were able to do this, the reason that they were able to do as they did in verses 1 to 4, giving out of their poverty liberally, is because of verse 5. First of all, they gave themselves to the Lord. They committed themselves to the Lord and the Lord's work. When they dedicated themselves to the Lord, this made them sensitive to the will of God. It was the will of God for them to give and give they did. Now, the fourth point is that giving was a proof of their love in verses 6 to 8. In so much that we exhorted Titus, that as he had made a beginning before, so he would also complete in you this grace also. But as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. This is the grace giving of the Macedonians. I speak not by way of commandment, but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity also of your love. So Paul here is point, he points out to the Corinthians that he has no intention of commanding them to give. Not, not, he will not issue an apostolic command for them to give, but he points out that if they indeed love God, they will naturally give. Giving was proof of their love of God. And here again, one shows his faith by his works. And in this context, the work which showed their faith and love was the work of giving. The fifth point Paul makes is to provide an example of a great giver. The greatest giver of all was the Messiah himself, which we see in, in 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, that... Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. See, Messiah gave of himself. He points out, Paul points out, that in heaven, Messiah was rich. But at the incarnation, when he took on the form of man, he became poor. Not merely poor by becoming human, but poor because he was born into a family that was poverty-stricken. And the reason that he was willing to become poor was so believers could become rich. Not material rich, because Paul has already pointed out that these Corinthians were not materially wealthy, but Jesus, but Jesus did this so that they could become spiritually wealthy. And in this way, Jesus is the greatest example of a giver. The Messiah gave of himself. The Messiah was rich, but he became poor so that believers might become rich. He gave of himself to become poor so that we could become rich. Now, the sixth point he makes is that they were even willing to make a pledge in verses 10 to 11. And herein, I give my judgment, for this is expedient for you who were the first to make a beginning a year ago, not only to do, but also to will, but now complete the doing also, that as there was the readiness to will, so there may be the completion also out of your ability. So here, uh, writing, or again, writing to the Corinthians, he says they were willing to make a commitment to be fulfilled in the course of one year. Uh, this is faith promise giving, faith promise giving, or the making of a pledge, it's a biblical pattern because we see it here, and the Corinthians had made it. They'd made a pledge. Verse 10 states that a year earlier, they were willing to make a pledge. And now in verse 11, they're encouraged to fulfill that pledge. I don't know, sometimes, you know, when we when we travel around, when our ministries travels uh, to speak in various churches or, or, or do some seminars, that church is never asked to pay the travel expenses or, or a minimum payment to us. All that is asked is that a free will offering be taken up for our ministries. We explain the work of our ministries to the congregation. At that point, they're given the opportunity to give 
uh, uh, you know, uh, a blessing to the ministry. So when people make a commitment to RL Ministries, this commitment is not between uh, them and RL Ministries, but it's between the individual and the Lord. If God supplies the amount that they commit themselves to give, then they'll send it in. If God does not supply it, then of course they'll not send it in. One thing that will not be done is to badger people with appeal letters or reminders of any sort. We, we just simply don't do that. We believe that the Lord will supply it if, they, if people have the attitude of giving. So the sixth thing that Paul teaches is that it is fine to make a commitment. It is fine to make a pledge. One should be willing to make a pledge and also be even more willing to fulfill it if God provides the finance. The seventh point he makes in this passage is that they gave willingly. In verse 12, For if the readiness is there, it is acceptable according as a man has, not according as he has not. What's, what's he saying? What, what's he saying here is that their willingness to give made it acceptable to God. So anyone who gives willingly pleases God. And that willing gift is accepted by God. If they give grudgingly, the gift may still help the one who receives it, but it does not put the giver in a good standing before the Lord. From God's viewpoint, such a gift is not acceptable. Eighth point he makes in this passage is that giving should not be to the point of poverty, but to the point of equality, according to verses 13 to 15. For I say, not this, that others may be eased and you be distressed, but by equality, your abundance being a supply at this present time for their want, that their abundance may also become a supply for your want, that there may be equality. So Paul is not asking them to impoverish themselves by giving. He's not asking them to take away food from the table or, or clothing from their children. Giving is not to be done to the point of poverty, but to be done to the point of equality. Verse 13, verse 13 here states that they were not to be made poor by their giving. Rather, in verse 14, the recipients may indeed supply the needs of the giver in the future. So my giving to someone today may in fact in the future, that one may be giving back to me something. For now... The giver is supplying the need of someone else. But a day may come when that someone else may be able to return and give to the giver. That's equality. Share and share. Verse 15, as it is written, He that gathered much had nothing over. He that gathered little had no lack. So in verse 15, Paul quotes an Old Testament principle in Exodus 16, verse 8, which points out that in the wilderness wanderings, Everybody was sufficiently provided for. If a believer gives to the point of equality, God is going to provide for all of us and our needs will be supplied. Now we see another principle found in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 14. Or this is, a, this is the third part of, of, of biblical principles here. We have some additional ones here. Paul again emphasizes eight points. And some of these are the same as we saw in previous ones, but, but some are new. First point here is that in giving, one reaps what one sows in verse 6. But this I say, he that sows sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He that sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. So if one sows sparingly, one will reap sparingly. If one sows much, one will reap much. This is the same as the principle he pointed out earlier on. One can never outgive God because more giving will result in more receiving. Second part we see in the first part of verse 7. Let each man do according as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. So one should give as one has purposed to give, according to one's ability. A similar point is made in Acts uh, chapter 11, verse 29. One should give according to his ability and according to his own free will or as he has purpose to give. He should not do it out of a sense of necessity or, or 
uh, as the earlier passage pointed out, when someone gives out of a sense of necessity or gives grudgingly, their gift will still help the receiver, but it's not an acceptable gift before God. Therefore, believers should give according to their abilities and they should give willingly, not grudgingly. The third point uh, in, is in ver the second part of verse 7. He says, for God loves a cheerful giver. This means that the believer should be giving with a cheerful attitude. I, actually, the Greek word used here is much stronger than just, just mere cheerfulness. It's a Greek word, hil hil hilarious. That means hilarious. The believer should be giving hilariously. He should be that happy about the opportunity of giving. He was, he was just so filled with joy that he's able to contribute. This is the proper attitude in giving. Hilarious giving. Now, the fourth point that he makes is that God will supply the giver's needs according to verses 8 to 11. This is 2 Corinthians 9. And God is able to make all grace abound unto you, that you, having always all sufficiency in everything, may abound unto every good work, as it is written, he has scattered abroad, he has given to the poor. His righteousness abides forever. And he that supplies seed to the sower and bread for food shall supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the fruits of your righteousness, you being enriched in everything unto all liberality, which works through us thanksgiving to God. Okay, let's unpack this a little bit. The more one gives, the more one gets. Then one can give that much more. Uh, Philippians 4.19 is also a promise which teaches that God will supply all our needs according to his riches in glory. One should not miss the context in which this promise is found. God will supply one's needs in the context of giving. If one is willing to give, God will supply one's needs. And the believer who gives will not have to be concerned with the necessities of life. The more one gives, the more one will get so that one can give even more. The fifth point here is that giving is a form of worship. We see in verse 12. For the ministration of this service not only fills up the measure of the wants of the saints, but it abounds also through many thanksgivings unto God. So one often thinks of worship in the sense of singing songs of the Lord or praising the Lord. Those things are all involved in the worship of God, but that's not all there is to worship. The very act of giving is also a form of worshiping of God. Not only is it a form of worship, it results in even more worship because giving will meet the needs of those who labor in the work of the Lord. Those who receive these gifts give many thanksgivings unto the Lord. And because they give thanks and are praising God, it results in even more worship of God. Every time God supplies our needs in our ministries in Australia, we thank the Lord for these gifts. And that thanksgiving increases the worship of God. Giving is a form of worship in two ways. First of all, one's giving is an act of worship. And second, those who receive the gift will give thanks to God, and that adds to the worship of God. The sixth point he makes in this passage is that the believer's giving is proof of his love for God and brings glory to God in verse 13. Seeing that through the proving of you by this ministration, they glorify God for the obedience of your confession unto the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution unto them and unto all. So he has emphasized this more than once. And the re-emphasis of this point also accentuates its importance. Again, the principle is that the believer shows his love and faith by his works. One of the greatest evidences that a believer does indeed love God is the act of giving. This act brings glory to God. This cannot be emphasized more strongly in light of the fact that it has been repeated more than once. The act of giving is a measure of one's love for God. The seventh point 
is that giving is a form of fellowship with other believers who are not present. We see this in verse 14. While they themselves also, with supplication on your behalf, long after you by reason of the exceeding grace of God in you. One generally thinks of, of fellowshipping with believers as fellowshipping only with those believers that one is able to be with physically, like in a, in a, in a, fellowship, in a congregational setting. However, that's not all that can fall into the category of fellowship according to this passage. When one gives to a ministry that may be hundreds or, or even thousands of miles away, he's fellowshipping with believers who are not present. So one, again, when one supports our ministry in Australia, for example, one is fellowshipping with us, even though he does not see us. When one is supporting a ministry in the foreign field, such as Japan or China or South America or Indonesia, no matter where, it's a form of fellowship with those believers who are not present. So any time that one gives outside of one's immediate geographical area, it's a form of fellowship with other believers who are not present. And they're in other areas. The eighth point he makes, this is the final for the night, is to draw his conclusion in verse 15. Thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. Now, what is God's unspeakable gift? The gift that God gave was his own son who became poor, that believers might become rich. That's the greatest gift that God can provide. He provided salvation, but it cost him something. It cost him the life of his son. And indeed, the believer's giving may cost him something. But just as God sending his son was a measure of his love for the world, which we see in John 3.16, the believer should be proving his love for God by giving as well. And that's as much as we're going to do in this session. We'll continue this in um, two weeks' time. Thanks for coming along. Study hard and grow strong. There are, there, that's your details. If you want to contact us, thank you for coming along.